in a word of prayer. Would you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, we do celebrate and praise you and thank you for the beauty of this day and this time in which we might gather to worship and honor you, O oh Lord. And so we ask as we gather in this spirit, as, as you've drawn us together by the power of your Holy Spirit, as you are immersing us even now within your spirit, we ask that you would make the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable before you. For you are our rock and you are our redeemer. Amen. We are in the second week of a sermon series called The B-Side Stories of Jesus. And if you're old enough to remember these then you remember that there were some types of, of devices that had an A-side and a B-side. Or maybe you remember the cassette, uh, the, you know, the A-cassette. You could put it on an A-side or B-side. And when I, I reminded you last week, public service announcement, don't try to flip over a CD, and you can't flip over an MP3. But it used to be that albums would have an A-side, which your best hits, the biggest names, the, the, the name of the album, song, would have been on the A-side. And the B-side were sometimes lesser known or longer songs. And we talked about how the A-side stories of Jesus, the A-side hits, are huge and and most people know them if they've been a christian for some time or reading their bible for a while they know about the the death the crucifixion death and resurrection of our lord and they, they know about the great stories like the prodigal son or the good samaritan narratives that that we talk about on the regular and that we return to time and again for good reason they are life-giving and important narratives in the life of christ that tell us a little bit more about who god is and who we are meant to be. But there's also the B-side stories that we might not return to very regularly. And, and if you're Christmas and Easter Christian, you've never heard of these at all. But they should be shared because they can also be illuminating to who God is and what God might be inviting us to in our walk with Christ. And so we're looking at the B-sides. And we talk talked last week about Jesus preaching in his hometown of Nazareth. You can go back and watch that on YouTube or Facebook or something else. But this week, we've moved on. He's, he's left his hometown, and after, being, after preaching there, he's gone out and he's done the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus has walked on the water. He's done the healing of the Syrophoenician woman's daughter. And we come to this place in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 7, where we hear a short narrative of a healing story that we're going to look at today. If you happen to bring your Bibles with you, it's a good time to open them up to Mark, chapter 7. If you have your Bible, but it's on a mobile device, then you can look there too, or you can listen as we share this word. But I want to read it. It's very short, and then we're going to explore it a little bit. And it's the healing. It says, Jesus cures a deaf man. There's actually more to it than that. And it begins in verse 31, Mark chapter 7, like this. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went away from of Sidon towards the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. They brought him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him aside in private, away from the crowd, and he put his fingers into his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then he looked up to heaven, and he sighed, and he said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened, and his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one. But the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Praise God for this word. To, to take a look at it, the first thing that I'm drawn to is the fact that it's saying that he's in the Decapolis. That may be something you're familiar with. If you know of a decathlon, you know that it has a whole bunch of athletic um, exercises in it. How many? Ten, right. Deca, right. So there's it, the Decapolis is actually a collection of ten cities that were esta established by uh, the Greeks under Alexander the Great. And, and then later Ptolemy uh, conquered that area and established specifically Greek-speaking, Hellenistic culture-focused towns in the area that was Judea. And so they said, okay, well, we're going to establish some new cities and towns that are focused on Greek philosophy and language 
and art and language, everything like that, and, and not any of the Jewish stuff or any of the other things. They wanted to be set apart. And frankly, kind of looking down upon those who were living just beside that area, the Sea of Galilee in northern Israel. And just some geology to remind you, uh, geography rather. In the southern part of Israel, there's the Dead Sea. And over beside that, there's Jerusalem and, and Bethlehem. If you, as you go north uh, from the Dead Sea north, you get, uh, you, you're following along the Jordan River. And in the north of Israel, you have the Sea of Galilee. And it is to the east of that that you have the, the Decapolis, these ten cities. To the left of it, you have the Sea of Galilee and the places like Capernaum where Jesus focuses his ministry, especially in the beginning before he goes on to Jerusalem and is crucified. And so Jesus is wrong with his fellow Jewish brethren for the majority of time. But in this narrative, Jesus has gone further north up to Syria and then further east to an area where people were not speaking uh, Aramaic like him. They were not knowledgeable, knowledgeable of Hebrew and they didn't frankly respect Jesus' own people. He consciously chooses to go to those who would say to themselves that we don't want anything to do with Christ. He goes there despite that inclination. How many of us are glad Christ has come to us even when we didn't know to call on his name? That's God's prevenient grace. That God has said, I'm going to make it possible for you to have a relationship with me. I'm coming to you before you could ever say, I want God. Christ has first entered into a place in which we could say yes to Christ. So Jesus goes to the Decapolis, and as he arrives, it says, they, they brought him a deaf man who had impediment of his speech. I wish I knew who the they were, but I can say this, they're friends. They're somebody, they're people who cared for this man, a man who could not speak and was deaf. He was mute and deaf. In our own era, I can, I can imagine that that is a real impediment to access of communication with those around you. And we have modern advances and and, and commonly understood, you know, like sign language and things of that sort. But in this era, it would have been extremely exclusive to be, it would have pulled him away from so many. And yet there were some people in that community who saw him and saw of his need and they took it upon themselves to make it their responsibility to help bring him some healing. What a beautiful thing that is. I hope you're the they in this narrative. I hope we, I hope the church is the they. In Nathan's children's time, he said, love the Lord your God, right? And love your neighbor as yourself. These are the two principal rules. Well, part of loving your neighbor as yourself is to see the need there and to draw close to it. And then this is what Jesus does as they bring him to him. Instead of doing a beautiful sign or wonder in front of the whole gathering, Jesus takes this man and he brings him to a private place. He brings him apart from the rest of the community and says, this is just between us. I want you to experience this. He looks at him in his eye so that they could communicate non-verbally. I am drawn by that. I am taken by that. I'm reminded of how important it is for us to steal away and have some time with Christ alone. To spend time with God. The the gathering of worship in this way is a beautiful and a holy and a good thing, but but how life-giving it is to go to Christ in prayer alone, in private, in secret, as Jesus says. To steal away and have that moment. I hope that you have some moments with Christ alone. Just you and the Lord. And if not, then, then know that you don't have to have the words to say, and you may not even feel like you can hear God. But just engage in that relationship. Engage in that conversation and say, I just want to sit with you, Lord. Not just by myself and not with others. I just want to sit with you. And Lord, speak to me, for your servant is listening. In that moment, this man is pulled aside by Christ and Jesus looks at him in his eye, and Jesus sees the need on his heart, and he spends some holy and sacred time with him alone. And in that moment, then Jesus does a healing, and it's the least CDC-approved healing in the history of time. 
It's not Fauci approved at all. Did you hear how Jesus heals this man? And I read it. it, it the scripture says that Jesus takes him, he, he looks at him, and then he takes his fingers and he puts them in the man's ears, right? And, and, and I don't know, maybe sometime in or other you've done this, right? And you've put your fingers in your ears and I'm not going to listen. And Jesus is like, no, I'm going to enable you to listen. I'm putting my fingers in your ears who, that have been clogged, and as I release that, then, then you can hear in a miraculous way. And then Jesus, he goes, t- t- he spits on, I didn't really do it, but he spits on his hands, right? And he says, stick out your tongue. I don't know, somehow, verb, non-verbally, he says, stick out. And, the guy, and Jesus grabs the man's tongue with his um, saliva-laden fingers. Not okay in, CD, in COVID era, right? Like this is, if your doctor does this, you go, that was a quack. We are not going back to that doctor. But then again, if you're in a place of needing real healing, if you're in a desperate situation, more seriously, we're thinking now, if you have cancer, for instance, you say, hey, look, it's awkward and difficult and painful to go through radiation or chemotherapy or something like that, but I'm willing to do whatever it takes to be healed. This man needs this healing. Jesus sees that need, and he says, are you willing to do it? And the man says, go for it, right? And he sticks out his tongue, and he says, here are my ears. And as Jesus releases this in a miraculous way, the man is able, for the first time, maybe in the entirety of his life, to hear again. Was it the fingers and the saliva and the hands? No, but Maybe that's what that man needed in that moment to feel convinced that Jesus, Jesus didn't have to touch him at all to make that healing possible. But he does, maybe as a help to him, to feel as if something dramatic has taken place. And so Jesus takes his fingers out of his ears, releases his tongue, and it's like a string has been cut that's been tying his tongue together. And without the ability to hear for all of these years, he didn't develop the capacity to speak in the same way as one who can hear themselves. And now, for the first time, in the lives of his friends, and those who brought him, he can speak. And he can't just speak like learn to put a couple words together. He can speak plainly. He's given an additional miracle of being able to actually put the sentences together and speak with a fluidity uncommon of a person who hasn't spoken before. This is a beautiful and glorious miracle. And among the things that's peculiar about it is the next thing Jesus says is, now I don't want you to go tell anybody about this. Now, as I read this, the first time somebody recognizes that he can hear them, and the very first time he opens his mouth, they're going to be like, there's a miracle that's taken place, right? Right? So it's really not possible to hide this miracle if he's going to go back to the they who brought him there and who cared for him. And yet Jesus is not ready to go to the cross. This is early still in the Gospel of Mark, and he's not ready to be taken by force and be crucified in the rest. And so he's inviting those around to celebrate it, but not share it too broadly that his time would be taken before it is actually his time. In the healing, Jesus says a phrase. Ephatha. Ephatha. Say that with me. Ephatha. It's the Aramaic of the term be opened. Jesus spoke Aramaic. You may or may not have known that. That was the common spoken language, even while Hebrew was in the scriptures and was read. The common language was Aramaic. But Jesus isn't in an area that's speaking Aramaic right now. He's in a specifically Greek-speaking community. And instead of saying dianoigo, which is the Greek of be opened, he says uh, ephatha. It's kind of like them saying, well, we don't know if you are as powerful or capable. I mean, you're just this Aramaic-speaking person. You're a Jewish man. I don't know if you can do this. And he uses his own language. He uses his people's language to show the power of God, that it's not Jew or Greek. It's not this or that. It's not. God loves you. It's that simple. And God's power is capable of bringing transformation and healing in his life, in your life, and in my life. And we praise God for that. Even when Jesus is saying, be careful, the people are going to think you're crazy, or they're going to they're bring down heat on Christ. You know, there's a time to celebrate, and, and so this man celebrates. The word, again, ephatha, means be open. So I'm asking myself and you, are we open to the work of God in our midst? 
Are we open to drawing near to Christ in private, in addition to in the corporate, as they say, gathering of worship? Are we willing to draw near to Christ and say, this is the healing that is needed in my life, in my relationships, in my heart? Hear me, O Lord. Speak, for your servant is listening. Are we willing to do that? And then the other thing is, is that this beautiful intimacy that Jesus gathers with him alone in private. And, and I wonder if we're willing to draw near enough to people for them to experience a blessing from it. Are we willing to be close to people? And this is, this is a difficult question in the midst of we're coming out of a pandemic, right? We've been taught for a long time now, stay away from people. I mean, you're already breaking norms. You're in church. God bless you. I'm so glad. But, you know, there are people that you know and love who think you're crazy for even being here today. But I'm glad you've chosen to be in worship. I'm, I'm glad that God has put on our hearts the importance of gathering together. But, but I want to invite us to get close enough to make a difference in people's lives. To be open to being close enough to make a difference. Maybe one day you've, you've heard of these stories. Maybe you've seen them. Maybe you've been part of them. Maybe you were in the bottom of the barrel, if you will. You were in the, in the gutter, and somebody had the conscientiousness enough to see that you were really hurting, and they said, hey, I don't know what's going on, but I care about you. It's amazing the difference that can make. Amen? It's amazing the difference of a person who sees somebody making almost ready to make a horrible decision and they stop their car and they have a conversation with that person. It can save a life. Just, just knowing that there are, that all of us, all of us experience a gap between who we are and the way we're living and who God is inviting us to. And Jesus fills that gap, but then Jesus also deploys us as his hands and feet to go bridge the gap in Christ's holy name, as instruments of God's peace, to bridge the gap and stand in that gap for people who are feeling far from what the, they, the life they would like to live, feeling far from God, or feeling far from any kind of blessing in their life. So I want to invite you to be open, to draw close enough to people, maybe people that you're invited to draw close to by God and discernment, close enough to make a difference. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody who's in need or everybody who asks you for help that you should go, I'm going to do that, right? Because sometimes people try to take advantage and some people don't mean well. And so the scriptures, re Jesus reminds us in Matthew 10, be, be wise as serpents and innocent as doves, right? To have discernment, to say, okay, I'm going to be wise enough to discern if, if I'm invited in this case to be the person stepping in the gap, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust that God is going to use me, and, and I'm, I, I know that I could be taken advantage of, I know I could be seen as gullible, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step in the midst of the gap. Test the spirit, though, and invite God to give you direction and discernment instead of just saying, no, you know, I'm kind of introverted, so I'm not going to engage in that, or no, I, I don't know that person well, or no, there could be somebody else. Instead, I want to invite us to be open, to get close enough to make a difference in people's lives. There's this beautiful story in the Old Testament, in Genesis chapter 18, where the story of Abram and Sarah entertaining angels unawares. Have you, do you remember this story, right? This is, G, Abram and Sarah are now old, and they've never been blessed with children, and they thought that they were going to be able to have children, and they're wondering if God is not blessing them in their life, and they say, well, I'm still going to try to do what is right and, and, and just and good, and, and Abraham opens the flap of their tent one day, and they see three men kind of walking by in the distance, and this is the desert. If, if you don't uh, help and extend hospitality to people wandering through the, in the wilderness, in the desert, they could die of starvation or exposure or dehydration, and so Abram waves them down and says, I insist, come to my house. Let me give you something to drink and some food. And they're like, oh, we're, we're fine. He's like, no, no, really. Let, please don't rob me of the opportunity to extend hospitality. And so he, he prevails upon them, the scripture says, to, to come to his tent. And they sit at the opening of the tent. And Sarah pre prepare, prepares some of the meal. And Abram prepares the meat. And together they serve them drink and food and hospitality and love. They saw the need, even though they weren't asking for that need to be met by them. Abraham and Sarah saw that need. And the scripture says that these three men were not men, they were angels, and they disclosed to Abraham and to Sarah that they will be blessed with a child. 
They have been blessed, and they will be blessed to be a blessing to a multitude. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2, we are reminded that sometimes we're invited to entertain angels unawares. because We don't know that the person we're entertaining was actually sent to, for us to have that encounter by God. There may be a person that's needing you taking that faithful step into an uncomfortable place because God has invited you to be the minister doing the work of God's ministry in that moment for that person. This week I read a beautiful article in the United Methodist News Service. I get those emails every week. You may or may not get those emails, but you know we're a global church and, and we have many churches in Zimbabwe and other places and and in this story was a story of um, the Reverend uh, Anna Moore Kalari this week. And she's a pastor in the rural areas of Zimbabwe. And she has a circuit. She has uh, like three or four churches. And the scripture says that she felt God's call in her life to go and help others to, to hear the word of God, to be an instrument of God's peace, to be a pastor. And she said, I'm going to do it. And, and they the bishop appointed her to this, this appointment of multiple churches, and they're not close together. And so she, and she injured her leg, so she can't ride her motorbike that she's given. So she walks five to six hours to go minister to her congregation. Every week, it's 15 miles to get to her first church. And she walks that. And it's a beautiful article. It says, Reverend Kalari is such a strong woman, uh, one of the members of the church, Sakuru said. Along with visiting members, she conducts funerals, provides counseling. This pastor is always there for us, they added. Despite the distance, she walks alone or sometimes accompanied by her lay leaders or a pastor parish committee member. Another parishioner says, since COVID-19 lockdown, Reverend Clary has been there for us. She schedules quality time to be with us. The old age members of the circuit teaching, counseling, and praying for us. I'm inspired by Reverend Kalari to be a better pastor and to be there more. But I think I'm also inspired just as a Christian that this is what we're meant to be. She, she goes to extraordinary lengths to be with people. Jesus takes this man and says, come with me. I want to be near you. There's a beauty to that. She draws near to her parishioners. Miles and miles away, with a hurt leg, she walks hours and hours daily to deliver medicine, to help them shuck corn, as the, scripture, as the article said, and also to provide the word of God. You and I are the instruments of Christ's peace. Jesus has deployed us, saying, Go, be my hands and feet in this world. Are you willing to draw close to Christ? Are you willing and open to getting close enough to make a difference in the lives of others? One last story. There's um, several families in our church who are, have gone through loss of a loved one recently. In one of the families, a teenage, teenager who's a member of our church cared for her grandmother in the last days, months, and weeks of her life. What a holy and beautiful thing that was. She didn't have to do it, but she chose to. And so in the last, again, days, weeks, and months, she helped care for her physical needs, take care of her, and sat beside her, and had conversation, and they shared stories. And I'm talking to this teenager, I'm going to tell you, she had a richness of an experience that if she wasn't willing to get into the uncomfortable, if she wasn't willing to draw near to make a difference, she could not have been blessed with that experience. She has had the blessing of knowing her grandmother in a way that she could never have known her before. And she tells me that she feels so enriched by that. That it's transforming her life. She might even, she says, be called to be a nurse now. She might look into being a nurse. Praise God. It is uncomfortable to draw near. It can feel weird to draw near. Christ invites us to be the people that step in to that gap. And our love of God and of neighbor to step in close enough to make a difference. We are called and enabled to be those people. Thanks be to God. Amen.